I write because I'm curious and I don't think that I through writing fiction can give you any answers uh, but what I can do is I hope ask some interesting questions. Norveški pisac Jun Esbe kaže da ideje za svoje priče smišlja dok se penje. U modernom rečniku to nazivaju climbing. Tako da je deo svog izuzetno kratkog boravka u Beogradu iskoristio za mini planinarenje po zidinama nekadašnje letnje scene Topčider. Posle toga otišao je na potpisivanje svojih romana gde ga je čekala reka čitalaca. Tu je Nesbe premašio sobstveni rekord. Potpisivao je 15 knjiga u minuti. Inače, autora koga s pravom nazivaju kraljem skandinavskog trilera, čita preko 40 miliona ljudi širom planete, što je 10 puta više od broja stanovnika njegove rodne Norveške. Jun Esbe rođen je 1960. godine u Oslu, gde je završio studije ekonomije. Prvu knjigu Čovek Šišmiš objavio je 1997. godine. Bio je to početak krimi serijala o Hariju Huleu. Usledilo je još deset naslova o neobičnom detektivu koji je svoje vrline uspešno uposlio u borbi sa sobstvenim i tuđim porocima. Među njima su Bubo Švabe, Crvendać, Solomonovo slovo, Sneško, Oklopno srce, Žeđ. Romanom Krv na snegu Nesbe otpočinje novi ciklus trilera u kojima glavni likovi nisu borci za pravdu, već antijunaci koji ne odolevaju svojim kriminalnim nagonima, a kojima paradoksalno na put može da stane jedino ubica mekog srca. Najnoviji roman je Magbet, priča o osveti, ljubavi, izdaje i zločinu. Nesbe ovim obsesivnim temama, koji je popularni autor, promovi se u Beogradu. I dok se njegovi fanovi širom sveta pitaju da li će se u budućim naslovima vratiti i ozovitim avanturama detektiva Harja Hulea, Jun Esbe ne prestaje da piše, komponuje i svira u svojoj pop grupi Didere. You were a footballer, broker, musician. So at what moment at your life did you realize that you were going to become a writer? I was 37 actually when I was uh, when I was a girl that I had studied with in uh, in, uh, in Bergen. Um, she worked for a um, publishing company in Oslo and we had just had a breakthrough with uh, with our band and she wanted me to write something. So she asked me can you please write something about the band traveling on the on the road? And I said, no, uh, I like the idea of writing something, but not of writing about the band, because, you know, that's the rule of bands. But what happens on the road stays on the road. So, uh, but I, I, I may write something else, I said. And for me, at the age of 37, it was when I wrote that first chapter, it was, you know, why did it take me to, so long to realize that oh, this is what oh, I'm going to do? I don't know, really. It's a, a, I guess I, in many ways I just postpone it because at the age of 18, I can remember me and my friends, um, we, were, we weren't dropouts uh, in school, but we would skip a good deal of the classes and I was a reader. I, uh, I come from a home where my, my mother was a librarian my father was a book reader, so there would always be books everywhere at, uh, at home. So I grew up with books, but maybe that was part of the reason why I didn't start writing a novel at an earlier stage. I think I maybe I'd, I had so much respect for the art of writing that it was like, uh, it felt pretentious even to try to write a novel because I knew my mother would read it and so it had to be good. <laughs> yes, you write crime fiction. Mm. So what uh, is a crime fiction for you? Why did you choose that genre? Coincidence, pure coincidence. Because I was, uh, when I went to Australia at the age of 37, I had like five weeks um, I had a five weeks stay there and, and so I knew that in order to 
write something that I could more or less finish, uh, at least have a draft in just five weeks. It had to be something simple. It had to have a story with a head and a tail. Um, and so I figured that I'll write a crime story because my first novel won't be published anyway. So I might as well write something simple and just prove to myself and maybe to a publishing house that I actually, I can write. But much to my surprise and, and, and actually a shock, they, <laughs> they phoned me and said that, yeah, we, we've written these, uh, this novel that you sent us and we want to publish it. And um, so I finished the novel uh, that I had written more or less in five weeks. Uh, I lied to them. They asked me how long did it take you to write it, and I said two years, and they believed me. So, <laughs> but I reworked it a little bit, and um, then it was after having published that novel, I was going to write another one. But at that time, I don't understand that the crime novel offer you as a writer a unique opportunity to almost have this interactive dialogue with your reader because... Yes, because there is always the difference between what appears to be true and what is true. So it, it uh, gives you a lot of room you to, to you invent, have, have to license. manipulate, to, to, exactly. to play games. You have this license to lie and to manipulate your, uh, your reader. And I mean, it's like you have this deal uh, with your audience, just like an illusionist that, okay, I will, I will make you watch my left hand while I do the trick with the right hand. And at the same time, of course, any crime novel, a murder history, you can make it be about that murder, but you can also make it be about something else and just, use the genre, the expectations for what is going to happen um, to tell a different story. And uh, that was quite early on what I wanted to do, uh, to write stories about characters and not only about murders being solved or not being solved. Uzeo je bodež. Ima li šta lakše nego ubiti nekog ko ne može da se odbrani? Odluka je pala. Ostalo je još samo da se to i obavi. Nije li u ostalom već ubio jednu bespomoćnu žrtvu na onom putu za Fors? Nije li već izgubio nevinost? Nije li tada vratio Dafu onaj stari dug u istoj valuti u kojoj ga je istekao? U hladnoj krvi. You come to Belgrade to promote your latest novel, Macbeth. It's Shakespeare retold in your own manner. So uh, why did you choose the bloodiest Shakespeare play? What does it tell us about you, oh, you Nesbe? I don't know. Your... I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, it's uh, oh, I, I, I guess I've always been drawn to to bloody stories. Actually, I I remember when I was when I was young, my my mother received a message from my teacher, and uh, because we were having an essay in school, we were going to write a story. Uh, with the title, A Nice Day in the Woods. I guess you, you have the same thing here in school that you have to write those essays. And, uh, and, uh, and I wrote that essay. The problem was that in my essay, nobody came back alive. And uh, so the, te the teacher got, got a bit worried and phoned my mother and said, that, why is he so much into to murder and, and, and blood? And, you know, is everything okay at home? <laughs> And uh, um, so I guess th that was maybe part of the reason, but I also, for me, Macbeth, the character of Macbeth is actually one of the inspirations for my uh, own character, Harry Hall. It's, um, it's the story of a character that is presented as your protagonist, as your hero, and then gradually he will integrate and, um, and, and become the antagonist of the story, at least partly uh, in Harry Hole's case and in Macbeth's case, he goes all the way, he becomes the murderer and is definitely the antagonist of the story. But still, you are somehow tricked into rooting for this character 
and, and trying to see the world through his eyes and trying to understand his, his, his choices, his moral choices. Um, and uh, so uh, it was in many ways the same challenge to take this character, Shakespeare's Macbeth character, and make him into a person that you can identify with. And that is, for any writer, that is challenging. Uh, of course, in Shakespeare's case, um, you already have a synopsis. So you, you, you know <laughs> Yes, you had the going. plot, you had the characters, you had the title, you had everything. So uh, you have... Yeah, we... we, we just uh, you that know, little I, thing to reimagine <laughs> your own no, story. And, and I thought I had this idea that I would change certain things in Macbeth. Because to me, it's, it's, it's a fabulous story and it's immensely fascinating, but it's not perfect. You know, uh, maybe, and maybe that's part of the magic. Anyway, when I sat down and I started playing around, changing a little bit here and a little bit there, I realized that there's a reason why Macbeth is a masterpiece. You really can't change anything. Sir Macbeth, he's a kind of modern warrior and he kills everybody who is on, on his way to obtain power. So, uh, uh, what was your main concern in making up his character? I know it's William Shakespeare, so I, I, I know that maybe I should be <laughs> worried, you know, that I won't live up to, uh, to, to, uh, to his masterpiece. And I didn't really have any that was not my aim. The first thing I did was actually to throw out all the prose and the uh, beautiful Shakespearean poetry uh, in, the, in the play. Uh, and I realized that I have to come up with my own language um, and I will just have to look at the structure of that story. And this tragedy of a person who is making the wrong moral choices and who is, uh, you know, going to, to hell uh, together with uh, Lady Macbeth. Let's talk a little bit about that love story. Your lady, it's in fact Lady Macbeth, she wants her lover to be powerful. Mm -hmm. So she's pushing him all the time. Mm -hmm. And he accepts to be powerful because of her. Mm -hmm. So is it, what kind of love is it? It is, um, and, uh, and I think you're right. What kind of love is it? A bit, because I think at the core of this story, it's a strong love story. And I think that that is sometimes underestimated when you look at the story. How love is actually uh, uh, much of the driving force behind what is happening. Uh, there are this, this Bonnie and Clyde couple. They are willing to go through hell, of course, to gain power. So there is a thirst for power. And there is a personal ambition, um, both for Macbeth, who will not uh, miss the chance of being king. I mean, at the beginning of the story, he's serving the king. He's a loyal servant. Just the idea of being king himself and having all the people around you serve you, it's so tempting to Macbeth, so he, he, he can't resist that. But also, like you said, he can't resist his lover. Macbeth je sustigao ledi dok je otključavala vrata vinskog podruma. Ne mogu, rekao je. Šta? Ne mogu da ubijem svog šefa policije. Pogledala ga je. A onda ga je uhvatila za revere, uvukla u podrum i zatvorila vrata za njima. Magbete, nemoj sada da me izneveriš. Dankan i njegovi telohranitelji su raspoređeni po sobama. Sve je spremno. Imaš master ključ, zar ne? Magbet izvadi ključ iz džepa i pružio je ga. Uzmi ga. Ne mogu. Ne možeš ili nećeš? In my case, in the Macbeth that is set in the 70s, lady his older lover is running the classy casino in the city. But her ba background is that she grew up in a family where she was sexually abused by her father. She was thrown out. She had to survive on the street, which she did through prostitution. And what she wanted was respect. 
and power among these people that had used her all her life. And when we meet her, she is sort of a, 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 a cougar to the younger Macbeth, who um, she has taken as a lover. And, um, and it's... Um, it's um, is it love? What do you think? I think it's love. I think it's love. I, I, I think there's beautiful and strong love story, but it's also a love st story that is uh, uh, deeming them to going through hell together. In uh, one line in the in in my novel, yes, um, you say Macbeth is yeah. saying, you know, you know, um, you make I'm me doing, you you make me going to hell, yeah, and 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 she's saying, yeah, and I'm coming coming with you. Yes, yeah, so wherever you go, I'm coming with you. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a true love. So. Yeah. so you're very interested in psychology of your characters. Uh, you want to, to explain, to analyze and to explain evil. Somehow and sometimes it, it, uh, it goes together. Madness and, and crime. Yeah. I mean evil. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and, and, and it's... Uh... Both, both are just words, and, and, and it's like in order to have a fruitful discussion about madness and, and evil and, and justice for that matter, it's like you feel you have to spend quite a few hours just really defining what you mean by the word madness. There was just a case in, in Tennessee now where there was a murderer who was diagnosed with a personal disorder based on that I had analyzed his brain and that combined with him being beaten as a, as a, uh, when he was young made him um, uh, having this tendency for violence and just discovering this he had his sentence reduced which is which may not sound like a very important case, but of course it is. Because what he's saying is that, you know, through modern science, we will find the, that the chemistry in our brains may influence our actions. But then what is madness? Where do you cross the line from just having a chemistry that makes it easier for you to use violence to solve your problems? to your neighbor, you know. And, and, and so for me, it's um, the more I'm chasing the nature of evil and the nature of madness, it just becomes more and more complicated. There is several layers in our crime novels, historical one, psychological, political. Did you want, in a way, to upgrade the genre noir? Uh, I don't have any ambitions outside, you know, writing writing a story. For me, it's it's all based on ideas. It's I, I, I try to keep my life and my work simple. But then again, I mean, if you if I look back, for example, I think it's true what they say that all writers are writing about their own lives. Are you doing the same? Yeah, I am. But somehow I, I, I thought I was just writing about this character Harry Hall that that it had nothing to do with me, but it. Seems like it's inevitable. Harry and Katrina su se vozili ni ser kedalski put ka majorstoj. Što ti je prvo palo na pamet kad smo šli u kuću? Upita Harry. Da tamo ne žive srodne duše. Reče Katrina i prođe kroz naplatnu rampu ne usporivši. Da to može biti i nesrećan brak i da u tom slučaju ona više pati. No s novog čega si to zaključila? Pa to je jasno kao dan, reče Katrina bacivši pogled u retrovizor. Sudar ukusa. Harry klimnu glavom više za sebe. Prvi utisak ga nije prevario. Katrina, brat, je bila dobra. A što ti ne bi rekao meni što misliš? Ja bi valjda trebalo da učim od tebe. Mislim da Birta Becker nije dobrovoljno napustila kuću. Odgovorio je. Otkud ti to? Pa nema tragova nasilja. Nema, jer je dobro isplanirano. A ko je krivac? Muž. Uvek je muž kriv, zar ne? Da, reče Harry, a misli su mu lutale. Uvek je muž kriv. Harry Hole, or Harry Hule, your detective. He is romantic, he is cynic, he is outsider. 
a very interesting and complex person? Um, he came to life probably very gradually. And it, it just started with his name. Harry was the name of uh, the local football hero uh, in, the, in my hometown when I grew up. And uh, Hol, or, or Hole, as it's pronounced in the Norwegian, he was the local police officer in uh, the village where my grandmother lived. And uh, when me and my brother would go there for summer holidays, she would always say that if you're not home and in bed by eight o'clock, then Hole will come get you. <laughs> And so, and I, and I never saw him, but I always imagined but who this. who is Harry Hule for you? Yeah, who? He's, and, 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 and he would be this just tall, scary, blonde guy with, with shiny blue eyes. That was how I imagined him. So, you know, uh, I said, okay, so this is the name of the character. This is how he looks. And um, from, from there on, I, I just went on instinct. I didn't like plan him in detail. And you end up, I guess, using yourself in that character. It's also inevitable. It's not like, it's not like he's my alter ego or anything like that, but you will use your own you know, sense of humor or uh, taste in popular culture. But do you share his intolerance towards hierarchy and internal rules? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, I guess yeah. I do. A little bit of you and Esbe. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, when you start out writing, you, you, you think this has nothing to do with me. But after a while, you realize that, oh, okay, so I, I did, of course, use more of myself in that character than I planned to. Many a Norwegian na prvo mesto, reče Gudbrand. Da bolševici ne uđu u zemlju, ako prodru, sigurno se vraćamo u Ameriku. U kapitalističku zemlju, Daniel je sad zvuča oštrije. Demokratiju u rukama bogatih prepuštenu slučajnosti i korumpiranim vođama. Bolje i to od komunizma. Demokratije je vreme isteklo Gudbrande. Samo pogleda Evropu. Još pre početka rata Engleska i Francuska otišle su dođavola od nezaposlenosti i eksploatacije. U ovom trenutku samo su dva čoveka u stanju da stanu na put propasti Evrope. A to su Hitler i Stalin. To ti je naš izbor. Bratski narod ili varvari. Izgleda da kod kuće niko ne shvata koliko smo srećni što su prvo stigli Nemci, a ne Staljinovi koljači. In the Red Breast, there are two parallel stories. The first one is set in our century, it's a crime story, and the other one, the second one, is set in the Second World War. You touch on the issue which is very sensitive still today. It's a collaboration, uh, Norwegian collaboration with the Nazis during the Second World War. Uh, why that episode is so important even today? I think that uh, Norway being a young nation, it was formed as an independent nation only in 1905. There's a sort of both pride and shame. There's a shame that the Germans occupied Norway without much resistance during a few days in 1940. There's a shame that you really didn't have a strong resistance movement like you had in Yugoslavia. Um, and, uh, but there's also a pride for the, you could say, few individuals that did stand up to the Germans. And uh, in my family, uh, it was especially uh, not difficult. It was, uh, it was difficult to talk about World War II uh, before the age of 15 for me. And I didn't realize. And that was because my father, at the age of 19, had joined the Germans and uh, fought because it was more anti Stalin and communism than he was anti-Germany. And for me, when I learned this at the age of 15, when my How father, did you feel? Uh, so it was awful, you know, because I, I had grown up with the same image of, of course, the German soldier with this helmet being sort of 
pure evil and imagining the person that I maybe respected most in this world and that I really admired and that I loved, that he had had fought, you know, uh, with this hated German helmet. That was just that image was, uh, was, uh, was devastating. And uh, because I had grown up more with the war stories from my mother's side of the family, who was one of the few Norwegians who was actually active in the resistance movement. So this was like a war where you, where you had both sides uh, uh, represented. And I, I, I once asked my father, how was the wedding with those two families? <laughs> but they were, I think they were actually okay with it because my father volunteered, he put his life on the line for what he believed in. Now, 95% of the Norwegian population during World War II just kept their head down and tried to get on with their lives. Do you think that, that today there is a revival of those neo-Nazi ideas? I mean, and in Norway you had the massacre at Utøya, uh, which many people linked to sort of a neo-Nazi movement in Norway. But it's, you can't really tell that uh, the, the man behind the massacre at Utøya represented a movement in Scandinavia or Norway. He was more or less a loner. Uh, somebody sympathized with him, but it, um, I wouldn't say that there's a uh, that there's a strong important movement. But you do, of course, have uh, the populism, uh, which is uh, uh, which you can see occurring now in the United States, in in Europe, which has to do with immigration, of course, and uh, uh, and you do have that. You can see that tendency in the Scandinavian countries also. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that you, I see it much stronger now than we did in the 70s and the 80s. On the background of your novels, there is a lot of politics. In the TV series, which is political thriller, The Occupied, you depict different uh, political games and manipulation on the very high level. So how do you get into the politician's mind? Is it difficult? I wanted to ask a question, you know, to, to, to my generation. You know, we are so focused on World, World War II and how our parents and grandparents acted during war, World War II when we were occupied by the Germans. And we can discuss what they sacrificed, what they didn't sacrifice, should they have sacrificed more. And uh, how would we act in the same situation? So I put up this situation where Norway is occupied by a big nation. Uh, and by it happened, Russia. happened to be Russia because it's the big country that is next to us, um, our neighbor. And it's a, it's, it's a soft occupation. Um, people are allowed to keep the privileges. They can still go to London for the weekend shopping. You watch the same TV programs. They keep their standard of living. The Russians only want the oil, but they, so they don't mess with the population. And in a situation like that, what would you and I be willing to sacrifice for words like freedom, sovereignty, democracy, if we get to keep our material privileges? How important is it really? That was like, my basic question uh, for uh, uh, on a very individual level. But then when we started to look at the story, then we started looking at uh, different political scenarios. We brought in uh, politicians and experts on military scenarios, and it got very interesting, of course. But um, 
I can't uh, I can't take the honor for uh, for uh, uh, for the screenplays. Um, I I just sort of came up with a starting point, the basic idea. There is a lot of adrenaline in everything you write. So, do you feel adrenaline while writing? I do. I mean, I have to. Um, um, I had to write for myself. I had to write in order to be to write suspense for all the people. I think I have to feel the suspense myself. Uh, in order to uh, to write a joke, I have to laugh myself. Uh, and in order to to touch people emotionally, I have to be able to touch myself. And uh, <laughs> I have to I have to admit that there has been times when I've been writing that I. I've actually been crying, and I'm not the crying kind of person. And it's not, uh, and uh, uh, maybe it's me just getting high on myself. I don't know. But it's I have to move myself emotionally in order to be able to move. Um